online right now. There are a ton of amazing, expertly crafted videos tracking the stagnation of Grand Theft Auto Online, done by some of the most passionate and talented fans in this community. However, these people, myself included, can't really tear themselves away from this game. And that's because there's nothing like it. GTA Online has the infrastructure of a Rockstar game with the expectation of an MMO with nothing really to bridge the gap. Now I realize that this is a big jump to make, but just hear me out. Now I would be hesitant to call GTA Online an MMORPG in the same ilk as some of the genre's heaviest hitters, and for sure it doesn't live up to the latter half of that acronym. There are these stats, but they're pretty underwhelming, and they don't really matter once you've maxed them out, and you get there pretty quickly. Not to mention, 32 people to a server doesn't really make this massively multiplayer online, in comparison to the thousands that some of the biggest MMO servers can handle. A medium multiplayer online might be a better way to articulate what is otherwise a very hard to describe experience. And using the framework of an MMO, we can more clearly define what features this game needs in order to become a superior version of what it clearly aspires to be. And yes, I realize that over the past few weeks and going into the next few months, a lot will change regarding the trajectory of the game thanks to the PS5 version, and we'll get to that later. But before that, I'd like to continue on with the main topic, and before that, I need to complete the caveat hat trick and first discuss the issues inherent to GTA Online. There are a million things to do in Grand Theft Auto Online, and they all feed into the same singular purpose of making money. But what happens when you've made all the money and bought all the things? Wait to buy more? That's not a great way to prolong your game, and if this was any other studio, this method wouldn't be sustainable. Sure, there are small weekly events and new missions, but those are band-aids, short-term fixes for long-term problems. The content added needs to have either impact or some kind of connected narrative. New heists, large-scale missions, or financial endeavors like the nightclub or motorcycle club need to have substantial impact on the world. Look at something like the Doomsday Heist. This update was massive and added a ton to the game. The storyline had huge implications while also holding the real potential to make a lot of money. But what are we left with? A new place to park my cars? An instant kill button that costs over half a million dollars just to press? Missions that I won't replay because there are faster and easier methods of making money? I mean, come on. I should get something for stopping an army of clones from dropping a hydrogen bomb. But no, instead we see the rise of griefers in sky cars. There's two sides to every MMO. Leveling and endgame content. GTA Online doesn't really have an end game. There's no overarching story, so any DLC pertaining to that isn't gonna be satisfying to the player base for all that long. This means we're left with only focusing on leveling up, which comes in two forms. The traditional one, where we see the number next to our name go up, and through the acquisition of vehicles, weapons, and buildings. Which is all well and good, but when the game jumps the nuke and gives us a military operations center, we've reached a ceiling. So now what the game faces is the difficult task of making sure the leveling side is fun enough to make players forget that there's no endgame content, which is inconceivably difficult when you have to cater to brand new players and veterans with over a thousand hours in luxury yachts. With this, we can see that Rockstar has really painted themselves into a corner. One of the issues with the MMO model not having an RPG element is that grinding is a bit foreign to most genres. Other than collectibles, what's there to grind in a typical GTA game? Another key issue is that RPGs offer loot as a reward. Do X mission, get a slightly better sword, spell, piece of armor, etc. GTA simplifies that and has you do X mission to get money to spend on whatever. This is like the difference between getting a physical gift and card with a little bit of money versus someone just handing you a larger lump sum of money. Neither are necessarily wrong, but when money is all you need, there's no secondary layer to selecting missions. This leads to optimizing payout methods. And after the rooftop rumble fiasco, Rockstar implemented a timer system that pays players based on how long they're in the mission for. So even if I find a shortcut or a way to optimize the run, I still have to wait 15 minutes at the end for the full payout. Unless you really enjoy what little story is presented in the missions, there's no real reason to play these because there's 
better ways to grind cash. Now, if story missions gave out something in addition to money, there'd be plenty more incentive to play them. However, GTA is at a distinct disadvantage here because giving out realistic guns with slightly higher stats isn't nearly as fun, interesting, or as viable as, say, getting a sword or armor in a fantasy RPG. A feasible workaround for this could be adding a larger mission that has higher payouts or some kind of tangible reward, but it's locked behind a lot of smaller missions. Sort of like how heist prep works now, but with a more narrative focus and an instant payout at the end. I realize that there are high level missions that are locked behind level progression, but that seems like more of a choice made out of necessity and not one made for player satisfaction. I think a story progression based unlock system like this would also push the writing team behind GTA to create a stronger narrative through line. And to be completely fair to the current team working on the game, they have done some things that are adjacent to the ideas that I've provided with vehicle discount for completing heists in a specific manner. Additionally, the few hints found in the Cayo Perico heist that led to the Dr. Dre missions were also a great step in the right direction. As it stands now, the current narrative for GTA Online is a rags to riches story. You know, just like every other Rockstar title before it. The current updates coming out assume that you've played all the other missions and are now a professional level henchman that everyone is dying to hire. You don't feel like part of the world or story, you're just a side character getting hired by main characters. Now I'll admit it's cool to see a bunch of fan favorite characters getting turned into quest givers, but all of this culminates in a narrative that has no real pull or allure to players. This is something that can be reconciled, but will take a lot of work because Los Santos has become boring to longtime players. If you've played this game for any more than 50 hours online or completed the story mode, can you honestly say that there's a single inch of the map that you haven't seen 20 times over? LA is one of the most interesting settings you could place your game in. It's got a lot going for it while also having a lot of room to move around. No matter how many points of interest your map has, it's going to become dull at some point due to extreme repetition. To perfectly illustrate the point of people's fatigue with Los Santos, look no further than the incredible success of the Cayo Perico heist. Even if you remove the fact that it's the new cash grinding meta, it's one of the most unique missions in the entire game. Having a brand new island to explore was just what players wanted and just what the game needed to stay relevant. However, this issue is far easier to resolve than my issues with the story. And it's in Rockstar's best interest to open up a new location that can only be accessed through something like the airport. Players wouldn't be able to bring anything along with them, so it'd be a fresh start without giving up what they'd already collected in Los Santos, something that longtime players have wanted for quite a while. This would incentivize players to buy new houses, new cars, new clothes, or maybe even a shark card or two if that's their prerogative. World of Warcraft takes about two years to produce their new territory expansions. They create an entire new area with its own set of mechanics, its own storyline, and its own unique items. If Rockstar took a similar approach while maintaining its current level of small updates and patches, they could potentially make something really great and set up GTA 5 online for the long haul. In order to retain long-term interest, Grand Theft Auto is going to need to introduce factions. This is evidenced by the massive boom of Grand Theft Auto role-playing servers that we saw last year. Players want to be more than just career criminals, they want a social role as well. If there's a testament to just how long this game has been going on, it's that players are tired of stealing millions of dollars in gold, diamonds, art, whatever, that they just want to be a lawyer or a bus driver, or they still want to be a criminal, just a petty one. When extravagance becomes boring, the mundane becomes tantalizing. Out of all the suggestions I'm going to make, this one is the most unlikely to happen, but it's not like GTA doesn't already have the groundwork set up for it. Civilians versus criminals versus law enforcement each could have their own tailored missions that fit the group's aesthetics and responsibilities. I realize that the civilian faction might be a bit difficult as high octane missions would really need to be grounded. Not many civs are gonna walk around with a weapons cache full of munitions on their back and enough bulletproof vests to take seven straight mags to the chest. But stealing your car from a police impound lot after a long shift at the Cluck and Bell sounds exciting to me. Again, after jumping the nuke and releasing flying death bikes into the world, context is the only thing that GTA can offer. If you played the story mode, then you've done all the exciting things the game really has to offer. Personally, I only picked up this game again because it's a great place to chill out with my friends. It's far easier to talk and play GTA than say Apex or other competitive games. But if some real structural additions were put into this game, I'd 
I'd be right back in with the same level of excitement that I had when I first went online back in 2014. Regardless of what the future looks like, I'm genuinely excited to see where GTA Online goes. It's been one of the most interesting and unique experiences to have come out of the gaming space in the past decade or so. It's a multiplayer game like no other, and if it, you know, adhered to the MMO mindset a little bit more, I think it'd be a far superior game. But I'm not here to do anything I more think than you open this. It's a little little late in the episode for this. Since you have this undying faith that Rockstar will eventually make GTA Online into a bigger and better experience, I figured you might want to talk about how they're handling Red Dead 2 Online. That game has some aspects that you said GTA Online needed, but continuously gets pushed aside and not updated. Red Dead Redemption 2 Online has a lot of the MMO aspects that I thought would be beneficial for Grand Theft Auto Online. However, Rockstar sort of doesn't care about this game, and that's evidenced by the lack of communication with the fans, transparency, no real updates, and constant nerfing of grinding techniques, which sort of leaves me in a dead end for research purposes. The story of Red Dead Redemption 2 Online is far more engaging even without the modern setting and has a narrative that is connected outside of the general grind. It also fixes the map issue. The play area is massive and players don't tend to conglomerate on one side of it. The sweeping vistas of this fictitious southwestern setting make for a true cowboy experience that the mission structure and money-making methods used to create a cohesive, well, air quotes cohesive, experience. There is some amazing interplay between the location, time period, and mechanics that really favor this experience. They also added roles, which are specialized paths that the players can take. These include trader, collector, moonshiner, naturalist, and bounty hunter. All of these jobs require the player to do different tasks in order to level up and acquire new gear. Now in order to get these roles you do have to pay in gold which is rather tedious to get because surprise surprise gold is the in-game currency that you can spend real world money on. That aside they've made grinding cash and gold fun with open world hunting events, daily activities, and grind objectives that keep the pace of the game fluid and alive with content. Though this is coming from a new player's perspective, I'm sure veteran players are struggling to find more to do as Rockstar is constantly neglecting this very avid fan base. To quote Rob Nelson, co-founder of Rockstar North, Having those experiences to draw from definitely helped us create the foundations of Red Dead Online, but it did not drive our overall approach. We always knew Red Dead Online was going to head in a different direction because it's a different world with a different pace and a different scale. You experience it in a different way. And that was the right call. Innovating on the already successful Rockstar open world online formula, Red Dead Redemption 2 Online stands out and even contends with its more successful older sibling. And considering that the two are under the same umbrella, I don't get why the Grand Theft Auto team wouldn't just steal ideas from the Red Dead team. No, not second one? Yeah, and that one's a little less savory. Maybe someday I'll make an episode in the same vein as my Halo Killers piece, where I take a look at titles that tried to best Grand Theft Auto. There are a lot of games that really fought to become top dog of the third person open world game, but none of them were quite as loud as real time world's game, All Points Bulletin. The history of APB is extremely long and very tedious. There are quite a few amazing videos that detail the development chaos and subsequent poor business practices that plague this title. I'll link those down below so I can stay brief here. To put it simply, the creators behind APB wanted to make a third-person shooter set in the modern day with criminal and law factions all in an MMORPG. Long story short, they wasted a ton of money and the end result was short-lived. The company went bankrupt and the rights got bought out and the game now sits in a bit of a neutered state. You'd think that with the pedigree of David Jones at the wheel, things might have gone better. You know, being one of the founders of DMA Design bringing Grand Theft Auto to life, well at least the first two games. While he never worked on any of the third person titles in the franchise, he did move on to found real time worlds and create Crackdown, a third person open world crime game that puts you on the opposite side of GTA. The game received critical acclaim. So with a history like that, one might assume that the proper response to Jones pitching an MMORPG centered around cops and robbers would get people hyped beyond belief. But Jones, as stated by some of his former co-workers, is often the victim of his own scope creep. APB was proposed as one of the most 
feature-rich games of its time. However, lofty ambitions don't mix well with money problems. The game ran into constant pushback, and by the time the game came out of beta and into consumer hands, the terrible monetization practices of paying by the hour, mixed with very little of the promised features, made the fan base die off at a rapid pace. Like I said before, Real Time Worlds did the Scottish equivalent of filing for bankruptcy, and the rights were purchased by another company who then retooled APB into APB Reloaded. This iteration of APB is more or less the same, but now it's free to play and riddled with aggressive microtransactions to the point of being pay to win. Honestly, the state in which APB sits is frankly depressing. Textures don't suffer from pop-in, they just never pop in at all. On one end, you have cars that are too weighty and drive like tanks with no treads, and on the other side, you have guns that are too light and feel like a pea shooter. The original guiding principle for leveling in this MMORPG was that you grow stronger and you unlock more unique clothing. The higher level you are, the cooler the clothes you have. A wild concept that is still in the game today. APB now is more or less comatose, and oddly enough, I would say that it died right before GTA 5 released. This game got chance after chance. Fans wanted APB to work. Investment firms wanted APB to work. They thought this was the hot ticket. So if we can learn anything from the faults of APB and APB Reloaded, it's that there is a large contingency of people excited to play a crime-based MMORPG. It just has to be handled correctly. In this era of games as a service, titles fight to be your end-all be-all for a specific genre through the use of MMO mechanics. Think of how Destiny is the only looter shooter you might play, or Genshin Impact is the only RPG gotcha game. GTA Online also seeks to be your only third-person open-world title. Because the more you're invested in a game, the more you're probably willing to pay for in-game currencies. We've seen the idea of a realistic crime MMO fail miserably, but we've also seen Rockstar retool their own idea to great success. But what can I do now other than sit and wait and hope that the game gets just a little bit better as wait. time goes on? Oh! Okay. You okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> oh. I thought, did that? Okay. Yeah, you're good, you're good. Uh Okay, so Rockstar has just announced GTA Plus, a subscription service for players that costs six bucks a month. For this, you get a monthly allowance of a half a million a month, a property, a supercar, some exclusive clothes, discounts, double and triple money on specific events, waived startup fees for certain aspects of the game, and exclusive shark cards that you can only purchase while owning the subscription. As far as we know right now, this is only for PS5 and Xbox Series S and X, and it's in response to the game going free to play. I'd like to speculate that a lot of this update is centered around inviting new players to this dense game, allowing new and old members to start fresh with a large sum of cash to start up your own business with, rather than starting from zero. This subscription service sounds like they added a way to fast track your ability to catch up. Sort of like how large MMOs offer a paid option to get to max level, it remains to be seen if this new subscription will add any real value for veteran players, or if it will just take away some of the weekly update aspects that we've enjoyed up to this this point. I don't think anything quite as dramatic will happen until the PS5 user base grows. Rockstar was still supporting the PS3 and 360 versions up until the free mode events update in 2015, so there's going to be a bit of a buffer between now and whenever the effects of the subscription service start to kick in. Look, the best we can hope for is that this new revenue stream allows Rockstar to create more meaningful content rather than their historic model of creating small to medium sized updates and just sitting back on their money. If you made it this far in the video, odds are you're a fan of Grand Theft Auto Online and have some very passionate opinions. Feel free to leave those in the comments below so that we can keep the dialogue going because right now Rockstar's at an impasse. They have to do something big, bold to keep the player base that they have happy. And all we can do is sit back and see what happens. Thanks for watching. Real quick, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Jordan from the YouTube channel Uninteresting Films for his voice and acting work in this episode. There's a link to his channel right here and as well in the description. If you're not already subscribed to Jordan, you're missing out on some of the most entertaining and unique videos that this platform has to offer. So do yourself a favor and go subscribe. Also, as always, thanks to Evan from Luckstaff for the awesome thumbnail, and thanks to Blake for helping me film this episode.